So again, if you have your Bibles, let's go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And verse 3 will be our text this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3 says, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. We are we are looking at this passage of Scripture and considering the subject of biblical headship or God's ordained headship as we as we think of and consider uh, the truth of what God has for us here and if you'll recall a couple two or three Sundays ago I looked at this subject and the the portion of it that, that we looked at the last time was that the head of every man is Christ. Now, you might think that today I would go straight into the head of the woman is the man, but I'm not. Today I'm going to skip right over that, and we'll come back to the head of the, head of the woman is the man, but today I want us to consider the head of Christ is God. There are there, there are a lot, of, a lot of truths that you can pull and glean out of passages of Scripture. Certainly, you can, uh, you, you can find a, a lot of sermons, uh, a lot of truths in God's Word, and uh, a lot of different ways and a lot of different angles to consider a text. The reason why I'm looking at the head of Christ is God is for a couple of reasons. One, uh, it's one that uh, oftentimes gets skipped over when we consider biblical headship. But also, uh, also I want to consider it because biblical headship is a controversial subject anyway in our postmodern world. It's a subject that is despised and it is one that a lot of folks don't want to hear. Uh, Paul is called oftentimes a woman hater and uh, to hold to biblical headship is uh, well a lot of times we're said to be out of touch with reality. We're said to be chauvinistic and uh, we're out of line with the times. But I want to bring up this portion of the passage in order for us to understand the example of Christ. I believe that when we understand the example of Christ, we understand where this is coming from. And a lot of the, a lot of the misunderstandings kind of will disappear, the Lord will. The subject of God's ordained headship is neither a club with which that we can beat our wives over the head with, but it's neither a, it's not that, nor is it a cultural issue that the church of Corinth was dealing with. This is something that is applicable for all people of all time. And I believe we brought some of that out in previous messages. But I want to also remind you that men and women are equal as far as being created in the image of God. Uh, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. 
It says, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in, in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. You see, only, only with a proper understanding of the Bible, only Christianity gives you the understanding and the truth of the matter that men as well as women have been created in the image of God. And so we stand equal in creation. You'll not find that in any other world view. Uh, the, it's not a matter of one being evolutionary superior than another. In fact, this goes even beyond men and women. This goes across all cultures. And so, it doesn't matter if the man or the woman is black, white, red, yellow. We are all equal in the sight of Almighty God as far as creation goes. It's not a matter of my monkey was smarter than your monkey. We did not descend from the monkeys at all. We came from Adam and Eve. From the very beginning, God created us in His own image. And so, we stand before God equal as far as creation goes. Spiritually, we stand equal before God also in Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so in Christ we are one. You say, well, preacher, how do you know all these things? Well, it's by faith, and it's faith in God's Word. And it's the truth of God's Word that tells me these things. We understand, though, also another truth, and that is men and women are different. There is such a thing as biblical masculinity and biblical femininity. And there is such a thing as biblical headship. And you'll find all of these things not only in observation, but also in the Scriptures. And so observation leaves man without excuse. Romans tells us that the, the world is without excuse. <coughs> but also... <coughs> Also, we find these things in the Scriptures. And so, having looked at the head of every man is Christ, today we want to look at the head of Christ is God. And the Lord willing, I'll look at the head of the woman is the man in a in a future message. Now the flesh oftentimes will rise up and say, never. Whether it's the man, whether it's every man being under Christ, in submission to Christ, or the woman being in submission to the man, the flesh will oftentimes rise up and say, never. I'll have no one to lord over me. I'm, I, I'm my own man. I don't want anybody to boss me. I'm as good as my husband, or I'm better than he is, and on and on you hear those things being said. And then the flesh will try to justify disobedience. What has Christ done for me? Or I'm, 
my husband, I can't submit to him because, and then the list goes on and on. And the slippery slope begins. But beloved, present day culture or reasoning should never enter into the obedience of God's Word. And it's very dangerous for us to dethrone Christ and in essence say that His headship does not matter. In fact, in John 14 and verse 15, He says, If you love Me, keep My commandments. I submit to you today that not only is this a commandment of God, but also we find a great example in Christ. The head of Christ is God. <coughs> now some might say, wait a minute preacher. I thought that the Bible teaches that Jesus is God. And indeed it does teach that. We ought never to forget that Jesus is God. In fact, the Bible tells us that very frequently in John chapter 1 and verse 1. <coughs> the book of John chapter 1 Verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In John chapter 10 and verse 30, I and my Father are one. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. In Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, verse 6, verse 5 and 6, He says, let, let this mind be in you, which it was, was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now we'll look at the rest of this passage here in a moment, but notice he said that Jesus, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. 1 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 16 you didn't know you came for a Bible drill today, did you? 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory mystery of godliness, he says, God was manifest in the flesh. How? Jesus Christ. And then in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7, First John chapter 5 and verse 7, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. All of these scriptures tell us a grand truth. And that is that Jesus Christ is equal with God, yea, that He is God. 
We call this the deity of Christ in His divine nature. Jesus is God. Now, the question remains, how is it that the head of Christ is God? Well, the answer is that He, to use, to use the terminology here, He submitted Himself to the Father when He became flesh. Now, when Jesus came into this world, when He was born as a baby, when He came here, He did not lay down His deity at any time. But in Philippians chapter 2, where we were just a moment ago, notice what it says here. We'll start with verse 5 where we started a while ago. We'll read the whole passage there. Verse Philippians 2, verse 5. Going on down to verse 8. It says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God, verse 9, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Jesus humbled himself, made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. You see, he became human and became obedient to the death on the cross. Why? He had no sin in and of himself. It's sin that it's it, we die because of sin. Sin is death. Death is in the world because of sin, but Jesus came to die because of the sins of his people. Jesus was willing to do this, willing to submit himself to the Father and die for the sins of his people for you and I. Think about this for a moment. God stepped out of heaven, came down here in the form of man for us. Hear the words of Jesus Himself. John chapter 3, verse 16. Very familiar passage, no doubt. But notice what He says, For God so loved the world that He gave... His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. <coughs> God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Who's His only begotten Son? Jesus Christ. In 
in John chapter 4 and verse 34. Notice what he says there. Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of Him that sent me and to finish His work. John chapter 5, beginning at verse 20. Let's start with verse 19. Then Jesus, then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, for what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. For as the Father raiseth up the dead, and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which I say him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming at the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good unto resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. I can of my own self do nothing, as I hear I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Jesus came. in the form of man, willing to do the will of the Father. And we see, it's hard to wrap our minds around it sometimes, but this is what He did. He had one mission to do, and that is to, He came, one primary mission I should say, so he did a lot of things while he was here, but his main mission was to come and to die for the sins of his people. And while he was here, he did a lot of great things. I mean, he preached some fantastic sermons. You'll never hear a greater, greater preacher than Jesus Christ. He performed great miracles. But he came to die. In John 6, verses 37 through 40. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. This is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that hath sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. We see this grand example in Jesus as he came and, 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 and as he lived, he... 
he submitted himself to the will of the Father and, 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 and he, he kept the commandments and he, and he did everything perfectly even up to obedience to the death on the cross. He lived that perfect life. And then even beyond that, because Jesus didn't stay dead, remember He rose again the third day, conquering death, hell, and the grave. Hear Him as He prays to the Father in John chapter 17, verses 1 through 5. These words spake Jesus and lifted up His eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify Thy Son, that Thy Son also may glorify Thee, as Thou hast given Him power over all flesh, that He should have eternal life to as many as Thou hast given Him. This is life eternal, that they might know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom Thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, <clears throat> glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. And so, we see We see that how that the head of Christ is God. But even now, in First Timothy chapter two, First Timothy chapter two, verses five and six. says, 'For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. You see, you and I, we don't go to some priest or some person on this earth in order to have access to God, in order to have access to the Father. No, we go to Jesus Christ, who is our mediator. Even when we pray, we, we, we pray to the Father in the name of Jesus, because it's through Him that we have access to the Father. He is our mediator between God and man. And so then back to our text in 1 Corinthians 11. to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, the head of Christ is God. God has ordained headship for the sake of order and to eliminate confusion. We've seen how that the head of every man is Christ, and now we see how that the head of the head of Christ is God. If he were willing to submit himself to the Father, if Christ, being the creator of the world, being God, 
was not above headship. How in the world can any man or woman argue with it? There is no shame in a man submitting to Christ, nor is there any shame in a woman submitting to her own husband. In fact, I, I dare say that it is a dangerous thing for anyone, most especially for a child of God, to rise up and say in word or deed that this is not applicable to, it, to us. Are we better than Christ? God forbid, we are not. May God help us to be obedient to His Word in all things, including those things that the world and the flesh might argue against. And may He add the blessing to the message. Brother Ray, would you dismiss us in prayer?